Good morning. If you want, you can also put where you're calling in from. Um, and we didn't do this yesterday. I just said put your military affiliation. But um, if you want, we can do that thing where it's like, all right, everyone... from the army put your like moto stuff in the chat and then <laughs> and then we can do like air force and we can see who which branch is the most unhinged it's going to be the space force <laughs> all right seeing some uh wow so many people Uh, good morning. What do, what time does this end? Um, this is going to end today around like, uh, what is it now? 1.30-ish? Yep, 1.30. 1.30. Excellent. Oh, okay. So it's 9.31. Um, I know people will still be trickling in. We had about a third drop off from yesterday so far. Um, so I know the rest of you are kind of like a captive audience because you want your CEs. But regardless, thank you so much. for being here with us on this Saturday to learn about veteran cultural competency. It is it is so special and so important that you guys are here to help us. Um, so, all right, let me see. Okay, so we're gonna run through the slides um, before we start with our first panel. Um, I love that people are coming from all over, not just New York, they're coming from all over the country. Um, all right, uh, my son's a Marine. Okay, yeah. So. If you have military family, if you're if you're from the army or if you have army affiliated family, drop that stuff in the chat. Um, I want to I want to see the army moto. I don't see the army moto, army family. Okay, okay, there there we go. The army stuff is trickling in. Okay, um, maybe this will just be lagged. But all right, now I want to hear from Navy. This is really fun. All right, Army. Actually, you know what? Okay, everyone go in all at once. If you already typed, we don't have time to go through one by one. Everyone throw it in. I just want to see who comes up the most. If it's if it's going to be like Marines or Army, Air Force. Um excellent. Okay, uh so just some housekeeping notes. Um uh Nell, Katie and I will be going through the questions, um the Q&A in the chat. We talked about the difference uh yesterday. The chat is for comments, the Q&A is for questions. Um during the conference, I will uh Nell, Katie and I will be answering questions. Um you can see the answered questions in the answered tab. Um the slides will not be emailed. Um Amy Sirkin asks, will the slide be emailed? The Yeah, the slides will not be emailed from our clinicians. However, our keynote speaker will be sending out his presentation. And remember, you'll be getting a supplemental material with select um, commentary from some of our panelists and their contact information. If you have, uh, and then there will also be a survey at the end. So let's, um, okay, let's get into these slides uh, so we can have a fantastic conference. Um, today, our two panels are disenfranchised and non-self-identifying veterans and community building. Um, if you want to hear Brent Russell saying you have to, we're, we're, we're luring you in. You have to wait until the end of the conference. He's going to sing at the closing. Special surprise song. Um, okay, so yes, this is a webinar. Unlike last year, this time your camera's off and you are muted as the audience. That's wonderful because it's less pressure on you. You can just relax, enjoy, watch, make a cup of coffee. Nobody can see you. Nobody can hear you. So hopefully that is uh, anxiety reducing for you. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. If you have any comments, put them in the chat. Okay, uh, live closed captioning is available for today's webinar. Um, please click on the live transcript icon of your bottom Zoom toolbar and then click full view transcript. 
Um, the session will be recorded and it will be uploaded later in the month to the Naswani's YouTube channel. So you will be able to see all of the, the panels um, in full uh, at, at the YouTube. Um, and then someone, Tito Mendoza asked if this conference has ever been offered in an in-person setting. One of the really beautiful things about our virtual conferences is it makes things just much more accessible in terms of who can attend um, and, you know, given the, the travel restrictions. So it's really lovely to be able to offer a virtual conference like this. Um, okay, so this is really important. Uh, Naswani's is committed to providing a safe and welcoming environment um, for professional participation for all of our members, partners, and continuing education attendees. Our strength as an association is our people, and we cherish the diversity and strive for equity and, inc and inclusion. We value all of our attendees equally, and we will not accept any harassing or abusive treatment during the program or in any sphere of association uh, business that undermines this value. So by being here, the cost of entry is mutual respect. Um, what this what this means as far as like the veteran space and what that can look like is it's really important since you know many of you here are clinicians, you're providers, you're in a really really critically important role. Um, you're going to come across veterans that have vastly different viewpoints, and we showcase and platform many of them here. Um, there will be veterans that come out of service and love everything about their country, cannot hear a single constructive critique, don't want to hear it. They just are incredibly nationalistic, incredibly prideful. And that's fine. That's an acceptable response to service. There will be veterans that come out and they absolutely are disgusted by their country. They hate it. They are ashamed by their service. And they are you know, just furious at the establishment. They have nothing good to say. That is also an appropriate response to service. Those two are very opposite extremes. We platform veterans of both viewpoints. Most veterans will be somewhere in between. Um, but it's critically important to understand that nothing that gets said today is a reflection of Naswani's official stance. Um, it is the lived experience reflection of individual veterans. And these are veterans that, you know, hopefully will put into discourse some thoughts, some ideas that will help you guys as audience members go on to support veterans in your day to day. So thank you so much for your understanding that this is a lived experience panel and that, you know, veterans are free to speak honestly and authentically here and not censor themselves. Um, and we really, we really appreciate that uh, community commitment to mutual respect. Um, now, was I gonna, <laughs> was I gonna talk about the cursing? I forgot. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, and then that's another thing. Um, Traditionally, cursing is, you know, considered unprofessional, but in a veteran cultural context, it's very important to understand that cur cursing can be a part of military culture. So there is no censorship on cursing for our panelists or here in this space. Um, we don't encourage it, but we acknowledge that it is a veteran cultural element, right? And that it can, um... can you guys hear me? People are saying in the comment, okay, everyone, okay. Uh, and that, um, sorry, there's a few comments that, uh, uh, all right, thank you. <laughs> um, so that we acknowledge that cursing, it can be jarring to some people and we respect and acknowledge that, but um, it's also important to understand that for many veterans who are commodified by the system, who feel unsafe around systems, um, the cursing can signal an anti-establishment kind of sentiment and build rapport. It's just, it can be, it can be a rhetorical tool to just build very quick rapport. I've used it many times as a peer. So I just wanted to share some insight because that can also be jarring. So again, this is a veteran cultural space. Thank you for being here. It might be a little surprising, but we're going to, we're going to experience it together. Um, and I, I am really excited that you're all here. Uh, okay. So, um, this is just, this is just, again, repeating what I just said. Um, lived experience panel, people are sharing their personal opinions. Um, this is not an official stance, you know, nothing anyone says is an official stance of uh, Naswani's, but it's it's important. Like we are very proud to have this platform for veterans, all different kinds of veterans to come and share with you um, their experiences. Uh, here's our wonderful advisory committee. If you have a minute, can you thank Amelia and the advisory committee in the chat? Because they have worked all year to put this together. Amelia's out on maternity leave, but she is the Niswani's point of contact that um, did a lot of the heavy lifting on this. And our amazing panel here, uh, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, so I'm really, really excited to be working with these guys. 
All right, Amelia, that's all for you. <laughs> um, all right, and then Nell, would you like to do the CE slide? Yeah, um, so you'll need to attend the entirety of the conference, um, meaning yesterday and uh, the entirety of today, and also complete the evaluation, which will be posted in the chat um, and also emailed to your email that you registered with um, at the end of uh, today's uh, day, conference day. Um, you can expect to receive your continuing education certificate via email um, by March 20th. Um, in addition, with that uh, CE certificate email will be a link with resources um, that will be compiled from all of uh, our panelists today and yesterday. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and of course, if you do have any issues uh, accessing or questions about your CE certificate, you're welcome to um, email our help uh, help desk info. I'll type it in the chat, info.nasw.newyorkstate at socialworkers.org. So yeah. Um, and I, uh, I will put my, um, if someone, I think someone just asked, how do I get on a panel or I know someone who wants to be on a panel? Um, I did put my email um, as a committee member. I'm I'm keeping a running document of a bunch of um, so you can you can nominate uh, if you want. So my email is there. If you have any questions, comments, concerns about veteran mental training initiative, if you have any Niswani's or CE credits, go go to now. <laughs> go to now. Um, okay. Thank you so much. We're gonna have a fantastic panel today. And uh, I I um is Inisa here? Is she? Did she? Finished breakfast. Is she on? Not yet. No, I'm on. Oh, yay. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Anissa. <laughs> I'm just going to um share my screen. <coughs> Can you guys enable the screen sharing? Yep, just to... All right. Got it, got it. Thank you. All right, so um, we have two workshops for you today. They're pretty much back to back. Uh, we go until 11.10, then we take a short break, and then 11.20 to 1.20. Um, so the topic for this one is called the disenfranchised uh, non-self-identifying veteran. And we're going to talk about what that means and then go into a panel discussion um, with our wonderful group of experts and panelists to talk about their personal experience. Uh, this topic is uh, very relevant to me as a clinician because like Melanie had said, there are so many different experiences that a veteran could have and they're not all um, you know, glorified in the way that we might expect. And I've worked with many who uh, I don't even know that they served until a couple weeks in uh, because they don't self-identify and uh, respecting their reasons why and validating and holding that space uh, is just as important as honoring the space for somebody who has great pride in their service and, um, you know, wears the hat, so to speak, and it's right at the forefront. So I, I find that there's like a spectrum with all populations uh, and it ranges in terms of where that person is uh, in any category that they identify as, whether that's, you know, gender, ethnicity, geography, um, serving in the military, right? Sexuality. There's so many different ways and cross sections that we could look at. So again, just respecting and honoring that space is um, definitely, you know, it, it can be a little tricky sometimes. So we want to educate today on um, just some knowledge around veterans that might feel disenfranchised or not self-identify. Um, so our panelists come from different walks of life, and they're going to talk about that. The slides that I have for the first 25 minutes are going to be just about what this could mean in general. So there's a few slides in here that actually have nothing to do with any of our panelist stories, um, but it's just from my experience as a clinician working with this population and then some uh, additional like research that I did to set the tone and give like an educational uh, framework on the topic. So I just want to put that out there because there's some slides that have to do with like uh, 
what could be a disenfranchised veteran, but uh, that is are not relevant to any of our panelists. So just keep that in mind. So what is then what does this term mean? I came across this term a bit when I started doing bereavement work and grief work. And I stumbled upon this phrase, disenfranchised grief. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And it's basically um, a loss that is stigmatized or taboo in some way, a loss that other people don't understand. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I, I actually looked up the definition of the word and had some trouble finding a clear cut definition of what the word disenfranchised means. So I tried to give it some some bullet points here uh, just to describe what we're talking about today. Uh, somebody who might feel this way um, could be somebody who had any of these things apply to their experience, right? So they could feel stigmatized or misunderstood or disconnected, segregated, uh, like something is missing with regards to their relationship with their service. And this list goes on and on, right? So I'm giving some examples, but there, there are certainly others as well. So here are some examples of like specifically what um, this could apply to for, for a veteran out of the service. Um, medical separation, right? People have mixed feelings about some of the things on this list and or strong feelings about how these correlate with their service experience. So if somebody is medically separated, um, if they have an other than honorable or dishonorable discharge status, if their gender played a role for a lot of female vets, um, that, you know, that's something that played into perhaps a negative experience for that person. Uh, that goes for sexuality and ethnicity as well. Uh, leadership styles or feeling unsupported by leadership being separated prematurely. So before you wanted to, before you intended to, uh, something happened that disrupted the nature of your service. Legal involvement can come into play with that as well. Immigration status. <clears throat> Mixed feelings around the actual service history, like the quality of the service. Uh, gaps in care that stop individuals from getting the support they need. So maybe they don't have access to benefits because of something that happened or difficulty navigating the VA system uh, post-service. Losses that the person experiences, uh, mental health, medical health. I mean, there's, there's more and more, but these are just some areas uh, that could potentially cause this experience of feeling disenfranchised or stigmatized around your service. And what does that actually sound like? What does that feel like to the individual? Again, I don't want to uh, assign, you know, feelings to, especially to our panelists today. So I want them to have the freedom to just give their own stories and and tell that them to us uh, after this part. But some feelings may include, and I, I have this in the slides because I want, there's a lot of clinicians signed on today uh, and I want everyone to feel empowered, like tuning in to different things that could come up. So if somebody ex expresses skepticism, distrust, feelings of betrayal, regret, resentment, mixed feelings, strong feelings in one direction or the other, um, feelings of disappointment, rejection, like these are these are just things to tune into. Uh, and they could indicate that that person has some type of mixed experience with regards to their service. So I I come from more of like the critical atmosphere of care. I've always worked in inpatient settings. So um, that's the lens that I that I see this content through. Um, so inpatient rehab, psychiatric hospitals, things like that, always inpatient level. So I see what those things can turn into for the worse, right? Like whether it's addiction or mental health or just somebody um, struggling and then not knowing what to do with that experience. And then it leads to other things, right? So I've worked with a lot of veterans who've had other than honorable discharges, and that really played into like issues with their identity and their pride and their sense of self. Um, and then that's led to other things. And when we really explored it therapeutically, we found that that was one of the major root issues that the person was struggling with, right? Um, so all that to say, it doesn't have to, but it could lead to other things. If somebody has uh, a less than perfect experience 
with anything. And you could find this in any career, civilian careers as well. Um, today, our focus is on, you know, veterans, but just putting that out there that this happens with other walks of life and career paths um, as well. So what are some subgroups that might be higher risk to experience what we're talking about today, right? And, and this doesn't qualify everything and everyone, um, but it does break it down. And, and I have kind of like a slide for each of these areas. And then after that, um, we really do, we segue into the panel. So um, yeah, bear with us for a couple minutes here because a lot of people have questions. They just want to know like, well, what does that look like for X, Y, Z? So I try to separate that out a little bit. And again, these are just potential subgroups. Like this is, doesn't have to be any of these things. Um, and there's additional ones that I'm missing as well. So women of service might experience discrimination, unequal treatment, um, more susceptible to harassment. Many female vets I've spoken to feel like they constantly have to prove themselves. And they are the minority within the minority, right? So people who serve our minority in the country anyway, and then females um, are additionally uh, narrowed down. Uh, sexual trauma survivors can be male or female, uh, tend to feel a lot of uh, betrayal and lack of support. Uh, they are often at risk of losing different things connected to their service, like their benefits, um, their career, Big reason why there's un a lot of unreported cases of sexual trauma is this fear of what's going to happen to me. I, I want to continue serving. If I report this, will this affect my ability to do that? Uh, recently, there was a shift over to third party oversight, meaning that these cases can be kind of tried uh, and legally overseen uh, by the civilian side as opposed to internally within the military. That was a huge movement. Uh, but just like with uh, sexuality, like with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the changes happened, but then there were so many people before the, those policy reforms um, that were affected. I forget the year that this reform happened. I should know this, but it was in the 2000s. Uh, and again, anyone who served prior to uh, the reforms related to LGBTQ, they're like, well, that's great that that happened, but my service experience was really um, affected by this. And of course, there's still uh, vulnerability for discrimination, harassment, and bullying with any of these uh, subgroups as well. Veterans who have not served in combat. We brought this up a couple times yesterday throughout the workshops as well, um, as far as like they, they're not sure where to fit in or uh, how to define their service, how to qualify their service. Some are not comfortable self-identifying just because they say, well, I, I didn't see combat, so therefore um, I don't want to identify as a veteran. Like some people think that that's, um, you know, an exclusive idea. Uh, you have to see combat in order to to say that you're a veteran. So there's mixed feelings around it. Obviously, we know, hopefully, after these days of education, that that's not what defines you as a veteran. Um, but there there are many vets who have served even for 20 years. Um, and even in stateside, like, uh, you know, crises, natural disasters, things like that, where they're seeing, you know, things that are traumatic, potentially, but because they don't go overseas, they're, they're questionable about you know, how to identify their service. Uh, that goes for veterans who are not injured as well. Like, and again, these are just conversations that could come up in session. Um, helpful to kind of have a head start and understand what that is, because these could all be things that are very difficult for an individual to talk about. So if they're talking about it with you, <coughs> excuse me, if they bring it up, um, it's just good to have that, that working knowledge this also came up a bit yesterday, Vietnam veterans. Uh, I worked with one individual um, who had said, he was like, I, I went from Woodstock to Vietnam and I was completely lost in the whole process, right? He's like, they literally plucked me from Woodstock and put me in Vietnam. Um, so I always think about that with this generation because it's definitely a different world culturally in terms of pre-service. <laughs> Excuse me, guys, sorry. Um, and also post-service, the community that they come home, came home to. 
the political landscape, the community landscape, uh, friends and family even. <laughs> and this quote on the bottom, uh, never again will one generation of veterans be abandoned by another, applies to many Vietnam vets who um, who feel that way. Like they, they want to overly support this next generation uh, because of what happened to them. Worked with a few individuals that they're home, they struggle, they'll get like a, a DV, for example. This is, um, you know, I was in an inpatient rehab at the time, so it came up often enough. And a couple of them really said, like, I don't want to identify as a veteran while I'm in rehab. Like, that's that's a part of me that I was proud of. And this is a part of me that I'm not proud of. Um so I can't be both. I can't be like a criminal and a veteran at the same time. Like that was the language. That was the the sentiment that I've seen come up a few times. Um, and of course, that person's service was their service, regardless of what happened after, right? So having those conversations and helping them navigate. But those layered issues when they come up with regards to family, addiction, custody, and potential charges, um, can really affect somebody's ability to then like proudly discuss their service history if that's something that they were doing before. And they'll say things like, um, you know, I feel like a sense of inadequacy or sense of failure. <laughs> Instead of set shutting down those conversations, it's really good to have those conversations with individuals as well. All right, so um, also segueing from yesterday, this idea of bad paper, right? That's the phrase that's commonly used. Uh, that applies to other than honorable or dishonorable discharge statuses, um, which can happen as a result of somebody basically getting in trouble, you know, to in basic terms while they're in the service and receiving uh, this type of discharge status. And uh, for some, it is like behavioral. For some, it is they get, um, you know, caught with drugs or alcohol. It could be a few different reasons, but the support that they receive on the community side is decreases uh, when they have these types of discharge statuses. So uh, a lot of these veterans will not self-identify, will kind of like turn that all inward, um, not have access to benefits and um I've worked with a few where they actually applied for discharge upgrades. I saw questions come in yesterday with regards to that. Uh, there's a couple of groups I've worked with in New York on discharge upgrades to get those statuses uh, improved and have been able to do that for some. And it means, you know, it means so much to them, but uh, there are many cases where they're not eligible for that. So this is kind of like a, a an issue potentially that carries through life for that individual. If someone uh, separates prematurely, whether it's due to illness, injury, um, they'll express that sense of unfinished business. Um, and then stigma, shame, what do I do now? Uh, survivor's guilt, like I wanted to continue serving and I was unable to. And this alternation between like, I want help, but also I want to be left alone. Um, this can be seen kind of across the board, like with a lot of veterans I've worked with, they, they want the help, they want to um, have those movements and, and learn coping skills and increase self awareness and all of that, but they're also trained to kind of like compartmentalize. So navigating layered issues like everything I just described can be further complicated by this oscillation between someone really wanting help, but also wanting to like do it on their own and kind of um, find their own way without having to lean on others for help. Take it one layer deeper into the, I love my service and I hate my service, right? And, and we have to be comfortable with these conversations just because you say, yeah, I work with veterans doesn't mean that it's always gonna be patriotic conversations, right? So being able to have these hard conversations with people that are like, I don't really have that type of experience, that relationship with my service and maybe, even having um, resentment towards their service for different reasons. And that's that's okay 
to hear that and hold that space and allow that story to be told as well. We brought up moral injury yesterday. I know there was some like controversy even around the phrase of it, um, but it is a concept that can come up and it has to do with someone's uh, identity and belief system tied to their service experience. So individuals who have this presentation um, might ask introspective questions. Um, it's different than post-traumatic stress, but there can be an overlap. There are some trends to be aware of when we're talking about this and some questions to be, you know, to listen and tune into. These are just some examples of what those questions might be. <coughs> Somebody who's questioning if they've remained, um, you know, a good person, if they've maintained integrity, their purpose, am I here for a reason? Have my morals changed? Has my belief system changed? So just something else to to listen for, right? And um, I would say none of these things are like a quick fix, but it's all great intel for therapy. And these are all things that should be, you know, honored and spoken about. And language is important when we're talking about these, you know, these topics, um, because again, the person might not feel entirely comfortable or even know how to speak about um, the nature of the relationship to their service, especially if it has these strong mixed feelings uh, tied into it. But the, uh, so our next topic for today is like call to action, like, you know, community building, why do we do the work we do? Um, and there's some statistics in there, like the the rates of suicide and overdose uh, and mental health in general for veterans are higher than they should be. And there's a few missing links that have been theorized. One of them is this idea of like a lot of veterans have, you know, injuries related to their identity or their belief system that we're really having trouble identifying and supporting in the community. Um, there's other there's other areas as well that um, we think might be missing, but this is one of them. So all that to say, it's not just like... Um, suggested that these conversations are important. It's really um, imperative that we're, we allow deeper conversations to, to occur. <clears throat> uh, so veteran and civilian identities, we have to also understand that there are some veterans who they identify more as civilian and that's, that's also okay. Um, and not forcing them to, to, oh, well, that must be for a reason. Like, let's get, let's get you tied more into your veteran identity might not be appropriate for everybody. And that's okay too. There are a lot of parallels between the two identities that, um, one may choose to segregate or correlate, or that could evolve over time and change all of those options are viable. And really the bottom line is like helping the person navigate and find themselves, you know, find their place in the world, right? That's, uh, there's no right or wrong way to do that. Somebody may need help with um, navigating their benefits. Someone else may need help with connecting to their family. Someone might walk in and want to be identified as a veteran immediately. And someone might say, I did serve, but I, I'm not connected with my service at all, and I really don't want to talk about it. And that whole spectrum and beyond that um, are all completely relevant, permissible, valid. Um, so we tried to pick a group of panelists today that can kind of uh, further this topic in conversation about their own experiences um, and kind of give a different look at some of the content that we've been presenting over the past day. So my first question to each of you will be, um, can you just tell everyone who you are and like your relationship to your service? Just started out with that. I know we're kind of jumping right into it, but I think it's really important for people to hear. Um, and there are a few questions after that as well. But if you could just tell everyone your relationship to your military service as like a starting point. Um, I don't know who wants to begin, you but should. I guess I could start. <laughs> um, I'm a Johnny Desiree. I served in the U.S. Army. Um, and I guess my relation to my service currently is I don't openly identify 
Um, it's not something that I, I don't feel connected to my service and it's not something that I like to bring to the table when I'm meeting new people, because that's not the trait, I guess you could say that I want, um, to influence how people see me. I don't feel like it's the, it's the strongest thing I, I could present to people about myself. Hi, I'm Preston Brown, and I am. Um, I served in the U.S. Air Force, and I see my name tag. It says retired. That's not who I am. I have a bad conduct uh, uh, paperwork, and that's not who I am. However, I have 15 and a half years in the U.S. Um, Air Force. Um, I loved um, doing what I did. I was uh, in the Comptroller Squadron, which is finance. I was deployed three times. And although the uh, Air Force might say I, um, I'm not a vet, I identify for being a vet. I know what I gave to my country and I know what I've done. Thank hey you, everybody. Uh, oh, everyone, Gavin Walters, uh, United States Air Force. I think now um, embracing more of being a, a veteran than um, if you asked me probably like five or so years ago, I would have said nothing about my military service. But now I'm actually more embracing it because the stuff that I've learned from the years of being out, which this year is 20 years of being out of the service, I realized that I could um, educate a lot of our service members from what I know now to help them um, if they are in that, in a situation where they feel like they can be, you know, be called them call themselves a veteran. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Amanda Madison. I served in the Army National Guard um, and deployed to Iraq in two thousand eight. Um, so interestingly enough, I share some of the sen sentiments. Um, I initially did not identify as a veteran, especially when I went, was in school and undergrad. And, uh, while I was still serving in the national guard, I didn't tell people I was in the national guard. Um, but I think I've learned over time, uh, that it is kind of important, um, it, it doesn't solely define me, so I definitely agree with that. Um, but again, like especially being a woman veteran and knowing that other women and other veterans in general just don't identify, um, I feel like like it's important to recognize that their service is, you know, like was said earlier, it's important. Anyone that served, anyone that, you know, made that sacrifice regardless of what their experience turned out to be because uh as a theme to this conference is that each veteran's uh, experience is unique um and as far as my relationship personally to service um i have mixed feelings because there were definitely some difficult times that i experienced um but i try to see the positive and see how i've grown from that and um take away some resilience and grit All right, thank, thank you all uh, for opening with that. And a few questions that, that come to mind. I think this topic is just so, so important um, and not one that you really see out there being covered. So can you, uh, you could tie in personal or professional. I know you've all, um, you know, also heard about the lives of others and their experiences. So it doesn't have to be about you. It can be. Um, but can you just talk about reasons why a veteran might want to self-disclose? Why, why, why a veteran might not want to self-disclose uh, their service history? What are some reasons that, that come to mind uh, with that question? Um, I will say from my experience, well, uh, a reason not to uh, self-disclose, at least I can speak personally for me and for at least one other vet that I'm, I am I do go to school with. I think our biggest thing is that it's something that it's kind of in our past right now as we're trying to move forward towards the rest of our careers, the rest of our lives. 
of, you know, okay, I was a veteran during this period, but what am I going to be doing now? What is it that I'm working towards that's, you know, cause I, I, I got out where I only served like, like four years in total. Um, I'm only 24 now and I still have like a whole life ahead of me. So for me, I, I feel like it's just not the main, the main component of like a Johnny Deseret, if, if I could say that. Uh, I could, but Preston, did you want to go? Go ahead, Mr. Gavin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I could use myself as a uh, an example where when I first came out in 2003, it was like right after I went, joined after high school and get a medical discharge, I felt abandoned. So by my abandonment from the military, because when I when I was leaving Lackland, I threw my uniform in the garbage. Like I disconnected myself from anything that said that I was part of the military, got on the train with the ticket they gave me and said goodbye. And when I went home, um, it was one of those things where I didn't want to tell people that I was in the military, but, it, but then they say, hey, go to the VA, you could get care and services. I was like, great. So when I went there, they said, no, you can't get VA services. So I said, okay, well, thank you for, you know, destroying my body and making me go, you know, get out of the service early and now not even helping me. So because of that, um, I can say that medical discharge and that disconnect and uh, feeling like the military uh, just abandoned me at the time of need and I think the time where I literally was going to kill myself, um, it made me not even want to promote them, talk about them, or encourage anyone to even join the service. So I think that's, for me, that's like one reason why I think someone will not even want to identify as a veteran. For uh, myself, it's easy um, for me to identify as a, a veteran, even knowing of a bad conduct discharge. And I have uh, to look at um, who I am and where I came from. Being Shinnecock, being Native American, um, we've always had to self-identify as, as uh, who we are. Um, never being recognized or acknowledged as Native American. So we're the oldest, Shinnecock is the oldest um, self-governed tribe in New York state, where the now the uh, 565th federally recognized tribe. But just recently, the town of Southampton has recognized South uh, Shinnecock as being a tribal nation. So that's 384 years. So when we talk about historical trauma and having to be able to self-identify and knowing who I am, um, that was a strength for me. Um, I know the time I gave to my service, I was deployed to proven uh, force in Desert Storm. I was deployed to Operation Provide Promise to Turkey, uh, Bear Base. I was um, deployed to um, Operation Deny Flight. And I volunteered for those positions because I understood what my mission was, even though my family may have not agreed that it was my war. I understood that it was my commitment and my responsibility as a, a, a U.S. Uh, Air Force vet to fulfill that need. So um, I know the discharge or the circumstances that I had to undergo and face to the point of, uh, and, and uh, I agree with Mr. Gavin, the shame. Um, seeing where I was almost, you know, to the point of suicide. And it was a process going through. But I I do not allow anyone to take what I've done away from me. So um, and I make it very important, especially when I go out for employment. I let people know where my what my background is, that I have a dishonorable discharge or a bad conduct discharge from the U.S. Air Force, because I believe integrity is first and foremost, is me um, and people are knowing my history with, with the uh, Air Force.
So I have so many thoughts, but I'll, I'll try to gather them. Um, as far as sort of some of the reasons why I didn't self-identify initially. Um, so my experience in the guard, while I was honorably discharged, um, I had a bad experience with a first sergeant who threatened me with a dishonorable discharge and gave me extra duty. Um, and basically the, the story behind that is when I was in Iraq, um, I went to a combat stress clinic to get some mental health support. Um, and after that, you know, I went back to duty. I stayed in country, served my time, got back home. When I was back home, I went to a warrant officer recruiter because I wanted to go from enlisted to officer. And my first sergeant immediately called me into the office because she found out about this um, and said that I was never going to do that. Um, you know, you because of my visit to the stop combat stress clinic, she said she could get me dishonorably discharged, threatened me um, with all these things. Um, fortunately enough, I was able to switch units and get out of that toxic environment. Um, but shortly thereafter, I left the National Guard. Um, and it was because of those reasons, because I knew I was never going to go anywhere because people were going to hold me back. Um, so, you know, after that, it was kind of hard. And I didn't know, I have, again, still have mixed feelings to this day, because on the one hand, of the bad experiences, but on the other hand, from those experiences, I've this is why I now identify because my my career has been to help veterans um, with their mental health and well being. Um, that's what my degree is in. That's the research that I I do now. Thanks. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the chat as we do this. Uh, first of all, everyone is like blown away by um, your ability to to talk about these stories. Um, these are not, you know, generally what we hear. So it takes a lot and we appreciate it. A couple of questions came in asking like, <clears throat> what was your lifeline? Like what, what helped you um, during that time that you kind of are maybe identifying as like a difficult one? Uh, or if you didn't have a time period like that, you know, what, what helped you transition? You know, what, what was something that stands out to you? Um, but if, if you were struggling, like what, you know, what was the one thing or the couple of things that, that pulled you forward, uh, to the place where you're at now? I could kick this off. Um, I'll say nothing really. Um, I was at a point cause when I, came out, I was discharged for, uh, I say, I told everyone I was like one of one percent of folks that end up getting medication in service and then end up having seizures, headaches, like a whole bunch of stuff happen. And then when I got out, it's like, you know, the military didn't want to help because they kept saying that it was prior service, meaning that it was basically my fault, you know? And then when I got my, eventually got my service connection, like 10 years later after fighting them, um, it, it didn't say that it was their fault. It just says, well, we can't prove otherwise. So we'll give you the service connection. So they still didn't even own up to, you know, what happened. And within those time of, um, I'll say feeling abandoned, the hardest thing was going through the, the sickness, like the seizures and the headaches, and the dizziness. I, I wanted to be a police officer and then become um, mayor of my town. I lived in Mount Vernon. So I, I graduated high school in Mount Vernon. So I said, I'm going to come back, become a police officer, and then become mayor of Mount Vernon. And so that was like, <laughs> that was like my goal. But unfortunately, because that happened, that time frame of me trying to figure out life of like going to school, going to different schools, different jobs, it was having seizures all the time. And if you, and I, and I think of an example, like how can someone identify with having seizures if you never have it? It's like stub your toe over and over and over throughout your whole body. And the agonizing pain that you feel from that seizure is like basically what I experience all the time. And honestly, you know, it, up to today, I still, you know, have uh, depressive and uh, suicidal thoughts because when the pain happens, I'm like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Uh, you know, and this is a self-disclosure right now. 
about three weeks ago, I did have a seizure that I had such pain. And I told myself, I wish this was the last one. Please, you know, take me, God, like right now. Because I was at a, I was at a, I've been at a place where I went in healthy and I came out broken and lost and so destroyed. And the military that caused all of this, you know, basically abandoned me in my time of need and the feeling of like, hey, you know, I need your help. I, and I and I actually fought to stay in while I was sick because I'm like I I was mission ready. I went to I had I went I was in RTC in um in um Mount Vernon High School, so I was prepared mentally to serve my country for 20 years. And this would be this would have been 20 years of serving if um I actually stayed in. Um, so that time of just not being, you know, that time period, I think I was not. I wasn't with myself, um, abandoned. I think I try to find reasons to not be close to people because I was trying to find a reason to commit suicide. Cause if you commit suicide, you know, no one will, will mourn you for you. And that's what I want. I want no one to mourn for me. Cause I'm like, I don't want anyone to, to feel what I felt after I'm gone. Like just push me to the side and like make me become dust in the wind. And sadly, you know, some of those thoughts do come up, you know, these days, which um, I'm always praying about. Uh, I have a family, which I'm always caring about. But, you know, when that pain happens, when that seizure happens, when that severe headaches happen, it brings me right back, right back into that place of the military caused this, the military made this happen, and the military still hasn't owned up to what has happened to me to this day. So um, it's it, even though I still, you know, even though I identify as a veteran now and I wear my Air Force hat, you know, it's to definitely to educate those that are, you know, that do experience that, you know, that trauma and, and feel abandoned and, you know, not able to complete their service because they are so passionate about it and will, you know, willing to do what they need to do to, to, to protect, the, protect the country. But unfortunately, they can't complete the mission because, you know, you remember you're the property of the U.S. government when you sign <laughs> that contract and you wear the uniform. So by them saying that we don't need you is basically saying that you're worthless to us and you can't do anything that we tell you to do. So goodbye. Um, so it, so for that time, I think it was it's been the, the most difficult time in my life. Um, so. Um, as I mentioned before, when I got out of the National Guard, I, I was kind of like in a rough place. And um, that like first year of leaving service uh, is researched to be kind of high risk for a lot of veterans. Um, I got into a situation um, with alcohol where I not intentionally, but could have killed myself. I totaled my car um, in a crash and thankfully uh, no one else got hurt, um, but I could have died. Um, and I think I was so lost because I had this idea of what my life was going to be like in the military and I left knowing I couldn't do that. And so what really helped me turn things around is like finding a new mission and purpose. And I think I've heard this from many veterans. Uh, my mission was going forward to help, you know, veterans that have felt betrayed, that have had mental health issues that have felt, you know, um, used up and discarded by the government. Um, so that's when I found that, you know, I took this unfortunate experience I had, but I wanted to use it in a way to help others. Um, and I got involved in research and research specifically on peer to peer uh, veteran programs and found that that peer environment can be so healing for some. And, and you're, you know, as a veteran getting out of the military, you don't have to necessarily be connected to military to have a mission and purpose. But I find, I think that finding whatever your mission and purpose is can be very helpful. Um, I will say, um, what helped me get through my experience, I think for the, the biggest thing for me that made me feel ostracized and, and still do is simply because while I served, um, I was a welder and 
it sounds so silly, but they sent me to a unit with no welding equipment. So I, I show up to my unit with no job. Um, and they send me to the motor pool and I am a New Yorker that didn't have her license at the time and has never worked around vehicles in her life. And on top of that, the army has not trained me to work with vehicles. And now they're expecting me to be like, well, you're going to show up now um, and you're going to work on these Humvees. And it's like, I don't want to be responsible for what's going to happen to this vehicle if, if soldiers get into this into this vehicle and it goes off the, the road or whatever, because I have no training on how to fix these things. So my entire contract was me sitting in a tool room that didn't really technically exist because it wasn't even on the books. None of the tools that, that were in that closet existed on the books. So someone can take that equipment and it doesn't really exist to our unit. So like, I wasn't really even holding, I wasn't even being able to like hold accountable for items that the unit could even track to begin with. So that's how useless I was to my unit. So the only thing that made me feel like I could get through the rest of my contract, understanding like, wow, I was trained for a job that I can't even use, can't even practice being a welder. So it's not like I could leave my contract knowing at least I have this useful skill and I can get a really good paying job with it. I didn't weld ever since I left AIT really. Cause again, there was no, nothing to trade on. They didn't even have the equipment They had no, no welding equipment at all. Um, so the only thing that got me through that entire experience of like, wow, I'm really useless um, is my family back home and me calling them every single night and us basically just laughing about the situation where it's like, well, at least the army, like, the army's kind of paying you to do nothing. And that sounds bad on one end. It's like, wow, I'm getting paid to do nothing. But if you want to make it positive, it's kind of just like, well, I'm getting paid to do nothing. I'm not like, that's a kind of a blessing in itself. You know, a lot of veterans had to give their life for that paycheck. So I, I try to I try to literally twist every situation that I was in where I was like, wow, I'm watching these guys work their asses off. And here I am in a tour room that's basically like a joke. And I understand that I am it was just it was it was very I already feel like an outsider of just on a day to day life before the army and stuff. And then that experience like solidify like, wow, this is also not meant for me either. Um, so the only thing that really helped me get through that was my family back home. And then when I got back home, that was still like the thing that make, made me at least feel connected to something and felt like I did belong to something. Cause I didn't feel like it belonged to my unit. And I didn't feel like I could really relate to the army at all. So it, it's always been my family that's helped me feel like, okay, I'm at least I'm connected to this family, my, like my new, like my at home family. Like the army never felt like a family for me. Thank you guys. Um, first, I want to thank Miss Melanie uh, Corinne before I start and just for encouraging me uh, to be here. Um, and when my, my uh, experience is with the Air Force and I really never took the time to really sit down to open a drawer and to grieve what had happened and and, the, and that loss uh, but I have peace with it and I'll you know I'll explain it but and I have to apologize to Gavin and Mr. Johnny because when we go through rehearsal I mean these feelings um when you start talking about them they were filled with uh, many emotions and I was I was just emotional I was crying <laughs> and I was going forward and Miss Anise had to pull me back in it was like well we don't have enough time but I'm just saying the emotions are, are real. The experience is still real and it's still very present. Um, but I had to get a, a um, I gained a different perspective of who I am and the experiences I went through. Um, family is extremely important to, uh, to me. Um, the military, um, they, I, I was found and I, and I explained to my uh, supervisor and I'm just going to share this. I explained to my, um, my director 
um, I work in a domestic violence agency. So I'm also from the father and I work in a domestic violence agency. But the um, the Air Force has substantiated child abuse and spouse abuse without an investigation based upon um, words from my uh, wife. My wife can identify as being white. She's half white, she's Spanish. She was an RN at the time. Um, CPS investigated the whole situation. CPS dismissed the whole case. The Air Force, again, they substantiated child abuse and spouse abuse, which when, when um, I look at the adverse childhood experiences and how I was raised, I was brought up in a house with uh, domestic violence. There was physical abuse that my brother and I used to stand between my father uh, coming against my mother. Um, I was brought up in a house where there was psychological um, um, abuse as well and emotional abuse. Um, my father in his anger, and I love my father very much. He didn't have a father, so he really didn't know how to role model to be a man. So we experienced these things. So when the Air Force identified and put this label on me, and there was no recourse that I had, um, I went immediately back to those situations because I vowed that I would never be that man that my father was. And now I'm wearing this label that that's who I am. I also brought a lifestyle of drinking in with me uh, to the Air Force. And the Air Force or the military, they oh, we do a good job with that, <laughs> with the um, the alcohol. But um, so when I had a history in the Air Force with, with drinking DWIs, being overseas. So I have this label and I was stripped of everything of who I was and it supports um, dissipated as well. Um, I was seen as very different. Um, I was shunned at the work. I was demoralized. Uh, the sergeants would come to me, the, a female sergeant. There, there was uh, adultery that was happening with my wife, even with SP. I was being threatened by uh, an SP. Um, so there was a lot of um, a lot of activity, and I really haven't really gone by. And, and and to label this and to really put things into context. And this is part of my trauma with the military. But I, I, I like I said, I, I think I, I I thank Melanie because now I'm at a point in my life where I have to sit down and really look at it to be able to identify it, to um put a put a label on it, to be able to articulate exactly what happened because I need that for myself. And it's taken 24 years to even come down and really, this is the first time that I had the chance to even to speak about it openly. Um, but after I, I was uh, discharged from the service, I spent three years and I was fumbling and trying to hold on to a relationship that wasn't there. And I, I I knew at this time that in order for me to be the best father that I had to be for my children, I had uh, custody of my daughter and custody of my son, that I had to be become a better man. So I went into uh, Word of Life Ministries. It was a residential program for broken and damaged men. And it was faith-based. And I ended up staying from 2003 up to 2008, where I became the program director. Um, and also the administrative director and the program director of this men's shelter. And God, I found, um, he had to strengthen me. And God became my source of who I am. God created and gave me an identity as well. Um, and he gave me a strength. And when I realized that there was more broken fathers out there. So understanding that... Um, I can't do it in my own strength. It takes a higher power, someone greater than I, to go ahead and go through this healing process and to bring reconciliation and restoration to families because when the father's displaced, the family's out of place. And so uh, working with men started in a residential program in a faith base. And then I was uh, I left that to, uh, to establish another faith-based program in, in, in uh, Florida. And I spoke to social workers. 
uh, I was in the community and they told me what their jobs were as far as going into the homes and seeing what's happening, the systemic problems in the house and identifying uh, what these ACEs are, the adverse childhood experiences and coming in rather than putting a label on a child. And that interests me. So I came back home from Florida to New York and I enrolled into Stony Brook University MSW program. And I, I say this, um, and it's not being um, prideful, but I went through my MSW program and I received, um, in my bachelor's program, I received uh, kuma sum laude because my heart was for helping people. And I knew that's what my mission um, was. So, but, but what strengthened me was my faith in God and who he is and understanding who I am in God and what my purpose in life is. Because when I was going through, there weren't many programs or services for men. Um, so now um, I'm with the Long Island Fatherhood Initiative, giving back, I have a different lens, but I also see there needs to be more changes um, through policy to help fathers. And when I say fathers, even veteran fathers, and many times uh, being a, a veteran, um, the family, we we as uh, fathers, as a veteran, when I look at that, um, we need time to learn who we are as fathers and how we even interrelate to our children and how we interrelate to our um, wife or our partner and being a co-parent. So, and I thank God, I thank God for what he's done in my life and who I am. And he gives me the strength and the courage that I need to continue to move forward. Thank each of you for, for bringing this to light. Um, endless positive commentary uh, and support and validation for putting all of this out here. Um, and as I said in like our prep meeting, for sure, other people have similar experiences or feelings as you and, and maybe don't talk about it. So uh, I think that that just has such value, just um, the, the unspoken topics, right? The unspoken experiences. So I have a list of questions here that I'm looking at. I'm trying to think which direction to go in now. I think what would be, you know, based on everything that, that you're each saying, um, what would be a good way to support a veteran who might be unsure about disclosing their service or not want to self-identify? Like, is it a matter of um, just pivoting completely away from the topic? Are there things that they should say? Are there things that should not be said? Um, what would you recommend? Let's say like there's a clinician, you have what, 1300 or so clinicians on here today they have a veteran they're working with and it's something's resonating there with regards to this topic, right? What should or shouldn't they do with that information? So oh. honest, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. No, no, go. I, I would say it's, it's okay to do whatever they're most comfortable with, right? Um, so if they don't really want to have anything to do with the military or you know, that part of their life is just not their focus right now, that's totally fine. Um, and and sometimes, you know, veterans are humans. They're going to go to, um, you know, healthcare providers for reasons not related to service too. So that's, that's important to know is don't just assume everything is related to their military service. But on the other hand, um, any identification as a veteran that gets you supports and services there's no reason not to right you you did your time you did your service whatever that may have looked like um you should have those resources available to you and and that's the one the probably the biggest um reason to identify as a veteran um i was gonna uh, say, I know that the, the, you, we all know the definition how the, the federal government defines a veteran when active duty time, like all that stuff. 
So when someone asked me at that time, I was like, no, because I knew the definition for veteran. But I, but we know that, you know, if you ask someone, have you served your country? You know, it's a much different response. Like, yeah, I served in the military. And what did you, you know, those could lead to other questions. Um, but the, depending on how, if you say, have you, if you're a veteran and have you served, you'll get two different responses based on what the person, you know, um, has experienced. So I'll say if you actually ask the person, have you served your country? Or, you know, if you, you know, ever um, wore the uniform, you know, for, for um, you know, for service, it, just phrasing it a different way will absolutely, you know, will possibly get someone to, to get more engaged. But um, I think it's actually, for me, it's, it'll be difficult because, I know when I talk to a lot of veterans or service members that have, you know, served our country and everything, there's a few individuals that um, served during um, career time and they weren't uh, deployed. They served stateside and they said that they're not a veteran. And that's because they were, they were in the reserve. They stayed, you know, stateside, helped with, you know, help, um, service members when they got injured, they were, they, they were passionate about, you know, their job because they were, they, they're, they were a nurse doing everything to help our service members, you know, but the one thing that she always tells me up to this day is like, I'm not a veteran because when I go to the VA, they won't help me. And, you know, and it's, and, and, it, and I don't think we'll ever have the right questions, honestly, for the person that to say yes or nay, because based on their experience, they'll just either disconnect themselves and won't even want to bring it up or mention it, or you know, or until they actually do, change the words of how a veteran is defined, you know, you'll definitely get more folks to um to, to start identifying as veterans. But I think that definition is a killer for for a lot of service members that have worn the uniform. I believe this, uh, my suggestion would be to listen. Um, if some some way, somehow it gets brought up because eventually people found, find out that I did serve. Just like nat through natural conversation. And um, and then the response would kind of be like, oh, they'll be surprised like that they find out so much later on. Like, oh, you, you, you served. Um, so I guess to to answer it would kind of be like if it does if it does end up coming up um I feel like a natural question it would be like oh so you know how, either it's like how did how, how how was your experience and I think that would kind of give you a very um strong indication of whether or not this individual is going to want to talk about this or not um it's either they're going to go further in depth into what happened or they're going to be brief about it and you can already tell it's okay. They're going to give me some information, but they're not going to, they don't really want to talk about it, which is really where I kind of lean where it's like, I give you a quick synopsis and I'm ready to move on. Um, or they might be someone who's like really into like, no, this is something I do want to talk about. And they might then divulge all that information for you. So I think listening, which I, I mean, I mean, I would hope, you guys are really good at <laughs> since this is what you guys do. <laughs> but I think really listening to them and really reading their cues is the strongest indication of like whether or not this individual is well um ready to open up and talk about something that might be something they really don't want to talk about. Yes. Miss Miss Anise, could you do me a favor? Just go ahead and repeat that question for me, please. So I can Yeah. So um if it comes up or you get a sense, what's a what's a good way to support a veteran who might be unsure about self disclosure? Right. Um, I believe it is important, regardless of for this is for me, um, and even to share with that veteran. That's an experience that they share. And it's something uh, that's a part of uh, their life and to be able to identify with it, whether it's uh, positive or negative. And I say that for us to look at a strength base, because even in all experiences, there is a strength within it. Um, when we look at even if it is negative, we have to be able to um, recognize that um, that aspect. And, and I say this is because if you look at a wheel, you know, I went to Dr. Bo O'Donnell when I was in the Air Force. And the first thing uh, 
he said to me, he said, Preston, you're so strong. My life is falling apart. And he said, you're so strong. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, you have to look at everything about you. He said, there's a wheel and I'm not wheel. You're a father, you're a vet, you're, um, he said, you're an alcoholic, you're a drug user. And he said, and if any one of those pieces are out of place, then your life is not going to be in place. And when a ball baron uh, locks, either the wheel will lock or it's wobbling. So it's important, even those uh, bad experiences, identifying as a vet, at least be able to acknowledge it, to accept it, and to move on. But most of all, identified what we did in the midst, even in the adversity, and use that as a, as a positive uh, influencer of who we are. All right, any other thoughts on this before I move on? Great suggestions. Is there anything that stands out to you that someone said that really rubbed you the wrong way with regards to your service history? And and I ask because like we don't want to make that mistake again. We don't want to repeat those mistakes and I think Civilians sometimes don't even realize when they're saying something to a veteran that's like, why did you say that, right? So is there anything that comes to mind that either happened to you or you heard from someone else or that you just know would like totally kind of set you off and make you uh, feel shut down? Um, I've, I've actually spoken about this before. And I think last year's... Um, uh, uh, conference, but I mention I mention it. I'm, I like to mention it all the time because when I finally got my service connection and was able to go to the VA and see a clinician, um, and that was like my first time actually speaking to somebody. So my first time actually going to someone and saying, "Hey, something is wrong with me. You know, I'm about to lose my job because I just got a warning." Um, I feel disconnected from my wife, like all the different things that I knew was going to lead to like a destructive path. I'm like, I'm going to try to prevent it right now. So I was able to go to the VA. I'm not going to say which one, but I was able to go to the VA. And um, after I think about four or five sessions, the clinician said, um, this is not word for word, but they they said, um, you know, I, I, I didn't think that you were going to be in the session for this long or they didn't assume that I was going to need more help you know from us just talking and it, it was it's not worth for worth for how they said it but it made me think that you know going into the VA with all these problems all these challenges you basically had a you 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 kind of knew what you wanted by us just having this discussion. You didn't really follow, you didn't listen to me. You didn't, well, you were empathetic with me. You are, you know, you didn't understand what I was experiencing. I'm a black man coming to see you for the first time, trying to get some help. And you, all you could tell me is, <laughs> um, you, I, she they didn't think that I was going to need any more help. And for that time, for the first time, I realized that, you know, I, I basically labeled all professionals that same way. I labeled them as prejudging and and uh, always determining what you want as a service member because I was like, okay, so I guess because I didn't come in talking about I was in combat, uh, I didn't I didn't project it every single thing that I think a veteran would say. Like I was in combat, you know, I saw all this stuff, like all the different things that will lead someone to be there. And once that happened, I, you know, I was like, all right, screw it. You know, but I, I guess this is, this is honestly, worth, isn't worth my time, isn't worth my experience, isn't worth, you know, the, the, the breath in my, my mouth, you know, because um, that showed me that, or at that time, it showed me that, you know, it validated all the stuff that I, I was perceiving that doctors were because that's what led me to having the seizures you know all you know the medical professionals there led me to having all these disabilities and now i'm actually reaching out for somebody from for mental health and they were so disconnected honestly if i think i was in a a, a more deeper mindset of like 
like bottom of the barrel, I think I would honestly leave that VA and take my life because that's the point. That's where I was at that point where I just needed help. I needed someone to listen to me. And when they said that, that just made me just say, screw it, you know. But then I had another session with another so the, and I had a session with a social worker who actually, you know, <laughs> helped me uh, shift from that mindset because once they said it, I, um, I was like, OK. So then my next session was with a social worker and they were more empathetic. You know, they listened, And I said, and I said, listen, I don't think I want to talk to this person anymore. I don't care about, you know, being here. And, you know, they were empath they empathized with me and we talked and, you know, for and that time, like, just like that. I shift from saying, okay, if I leave this place, I'm probably going to do something to, okay, at least somebody's here willing to listen, talk, and understand what I'm experiencing. Maybe I will continue to give this a try. Maybe I will continue to seek help and talk to folks. And, you know, and, I, and I've continued that. Now, I think it's been five years now since I've been in therapy. Um, you know, for me, it's it has been a challenge, but... I'll say that person's perception of who I was as a veteran and not what they expected to be a veteran really deterred me from, you know, could have deterred me from going to the VA. And when they talk about how, you know, the why veterans will kill themselves, that's why. Because the per, the indivi some individuals that's in there will not understand why that person is there and they already have perceptions of why a veteran will be there. So I think that's one way, one reason why, one one thing that um, I've experienced. I guess uh, my experience is that the, uh, as, as far as in the Air Force, they treated the uh, behavior and not the person. So they're always looking at the behavior and this is the scope of practice that we have to work in, meaning regulation. Um, and and again, I, I said I, I was drinking and driving, went through, and the first thing I identified as Native American, and immediately they said, you're an alcoholic. <laughs> and when they said that, I immediately shut down. Anything that they had to say to me after that, because they didn't even know my story, where I came from, what happened. So, um, and again, it's uh, that, that prejudgment. Um, Even uh, going through um, the experience uh, coming out, it, it was, um, I was never allowed to express who I was or what even happened in this situation. And I, I, I do understand, and, I, and I'm going from education now that um, I, I certified in uh, DV um, MRT, that when, once you're considered a batterer, you're not here to happen or to hear what happened to that individual. Everything is shut down. But that wasn't the case. And I'm left with not being able to express myself or what happened. And so uh, my discharge wasn't because of uh, the. Um, it wasn't because of what they uh, the, the charges that they said. It was me going to from drugs, um, from alcohol to drugs in order to deal with the pain and the emotion because I was not able to to express myself or no one was even willing to hear my side of the story. So I was shut down and everything was um, internalized and it was imploded. So when when uh, Gavin speaks of, of empathy, I wish there was, you know, and I look back and I say, I wish, I wish um, there was someone who was able to even to come down and hear what I had to say. And I, I love what Brenny uh, Brown says about empathy. It's asking about what happened, but it, it means going down further. It's meeting you as they say in social work, where you're at. And even in those hard places to hear. But if we're not going down to those places and in, into those depths, um, we're really never gonna get the full uh, story of that individual in counseling. And being in the military, uh, any military person, they want to know who they're in the trench with, who's got their back. And it's the same thing with counseling about them opening up. So, I guess. I'm... I think the only thing that I could really suggest, because um, I haven't come across too many experiences of uh, 
of people of, of individuals saying something that makes me shut down because I'm pretty good with when I want to reveal whether or not to this person I, I served or not. Um, but I will say that the moments where I'm like, okay, I I can sum up this person already is the assumptions that they make once they once I do share with them that I served in the army. If they're going to then assume that I'm Hua or they're going to assume that my experience was like I'm I'm a GI Jane all of a sudden, basically. <laughs> Um, then I really, I'm not going to take that person seriously at all. Um, cause I feel as though it's kind of crazy to um, like look at one aspect of a person and then think you have an entire picture of them. That can be literally in any regard, like looking at me as a woman or a black woman or a Haitian woman, like whatever. Um, so for you to then look at me and be like, oh, she served in the army. She must be this badass, like she she's done all these crazy things like if you assume all, all of a sudden oh this criteria because she served that i'm not going to take you seriously so i think the biggest thing is like just don't assume just understand like oh that person served like that's the, that's the piece of information that they, they gave you oh i served in this capacity then that's the thing you should assume about them because that's what they've told you um so i wouldn't go off with your imagination as to like what those things might mean i would just be like if you have another question, if you want to understand them a little more, ask those questions. But I would avoid assumptions at, at all costs. And uh, Johnny, I think in the beginning, you had said a good follow-up question is like, what was that like for you? Because it's open-ended. Right. That's great. Thank you. All right. Any other thoughts on this? Amanda, did you say something? You didn't. I didn't, because I think what everyone want, said was, it was okay. so spot on. You know, don't make assumptions. Uh, check, you know, what you think you know about military service. If you haven't served, embrace that you know nothing about it. <laughs> and just listen to what the veteran has to say about their own experience. So a couple questions came in and you don't all have to speak to it, but the whole thank you for your service statement. Thoughts on that, alternatives to that. I, I've definitely heard people be like, I don't want to be thanked for my service. That definitely, you know, doesn't feel good to me. But then as a civilian, I know like if I see someone who, you know, is wearing something that indicates they served, it's it's nice to offer them something. Um like I recognize that you served or, oh, you, you served in the military or some recognition of it. What would you recommend as a statement? Um, I can say the thank you to the service. For me, it doesn't uh, affect me, phase me, or I don't think twice of it. But I know some individuals say like, you know, when you say welcome home, you know, that really, you know, um, helps um with certain individuals understand like oh okay this person appreciate it or say you know welcome home how you doing you know have a conversation opposed to the saying thank you because I mean thank you is great but sometimes that conversation you have with somebody like right then and there will allow them to understand why you're saying thank you or you just saying thank you for you know the hat that you see or you know you have a veteran plate whatever it is but they absolutely appreciate I think if you talk to a Vietnam vet or the older vets, they'll definitely have those conversations. I, I know I like to, you know, talk to people when um, they say thank you and say, hey, well, how's your time in service? And, I, and I'll absolutely, you know, share my time and ask them, hey, do you have children that's going in there? And then I'll educate them, you know, because and then I'm like, wow, you know, this is a great way to educate this family that have a family member that's going in the military, like understand all these benefits and things before you get out. So for me, it welcomes a conversation that will allow that person to learn more about the military. Yeah, this is such a, a, a mixed bag question because I know very many different veterans who feel strongly about it. Um, and I think um, before you say thank you for your service to someone, ask yourself, why are you saying it? Like um, Gavin mentioned, like like a, the veteran's going to know, are you just saying it because that's like the, the norm, the polite thing to say? 
Or are you saying, cause you genuinely feel that and you wanna know more about this person's experience. So, I mean, there's lots of other things that can be said. Um, like if someone says it to me and, and it opens up a conversation like, oh, thank you for service. What did you do? You know, what was that like? Um, that kind of thing. But if it's just like, I, I've had too many agencies and, and people that know that I'm a veteran and say that and just feel injured. So that would be my answer. I appreciate the warm fuzzies. <laughs> no, I say that because um, I know the sacrifice um, that I put in. I know the time that I put in. I know the hours that I put in. So when I hear that, there is an acknowledgement. Because um, I could be sitting in with uh, individuals who look at my discharge and don't consider me um, a vet. And when someone says, thank you for your service, uh, for me, I hear acknowledgement of what I did do. It's um, It feels much better than being ignored. Yeah, can I just add, I appreciate the warm, fuzzy feeling too, because, you know, not many people automatically identify me or recognize me as a veteran. So it, like I said, there are times when it does feel good too. I was going to say, um, I, I agree with Gavin in the sense of that it doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, I understand that, that it's like a formality at this point. It's like a handshake for me. So I don't think too much about it. Um, it sometimes makes me laugh because it's kind of just like, <laughs> this tagline it's like oh you're a veteran thank you for your service it's like this throwaway thing for me so I mean it makes me smile sometimes because I think it's funny but um I don't really think about it too much I just I just move on I understand it's a formality it's kind of what's expected to be said so as a suggestion I I do agree with Amanda when it, when it comes to like if you like you should actually so far you're saying it if you really want to like be cognizant of like what like of of that saying like if you're saying it because you genuinely mean it then you should say because you genuinely want to say it but if you're just saying it because that's kind of the expectation then understand that that's that's the kind of energy you're putting towards that veteran and the veteran could probably like read that or like a mile away all right great feedback Super helpful. Um, I like that comment about like authenticity too, as opposed to just like, like when you pass somebody by and you're just like, how are you? But you keep walking. Like you're not actually asking them how they are. Um, so yeah, ta I, taking the pause is nice. I've found like if you see, I think someone made a comment about like, what if I see someone just like out in passing? Not that they're going to want to stop and have a whole conversation with you but just like taking a pause as opposed to just saying it and and going on like it's just a check in the box um maybe the last question we have just a few minutes left what is an area that you would like to see improvement in either in the military or in the community first thing that comes to mind like wow i really wish xyz what do, what do you think? Core veterans, obviously. I definitely have to say uh, the reintegration. Um, I know what when I was coming out, it was, you know, here's the papers, let go home and figure it out. And I don't think it, it changed to the point where when someone is getting just discharged, they get all the information, but also the education too. Because I know when someone's ETS and out, you know, they're just thinking about leaving service and and not thinking too much about, okay, what I do after service, but just like, hey, this is the end of contract. Let me do what I need to do. But I think that information is really, really uh, important. The education, especially knowing like what's happening in your community. If you're active and you've been out for four years, a lot of stuff happened in that four years in your community. If you're going back there, you want to know, you know, what jobs are available. You want to know what um, things are, you're as capable, you know, what you're capable of doing. Like a lot of individuals don't know that, you know, depending on how they serve, they could get, um, I think, and if anybody's in front of VA, please, you know, correct me. I think four or five years of um, VA healthcare it, that's free health care, you know, that a lot of service members don't know about that, you know, they might be told, you know, due to whim of ETS and out, but um, but they don't but it won't gravitate to them like, oh, wait a minute, I get health care 
when I get out in the V, you know, so those are things that I think is really important just for um, our veterans to know, because, you know, the VA is a great resource when you actually can utilize it when you when you need the services. I mean, it's state of the art, you know, things that, you know, so many individuals don't know about that the VA provides. Like I have um, my, my Apple um, pad, iPad that I could telehealth. Um, there's so many things. I think there's a, a music pillow that has Bluetooth that when you when you have issues sleeping, the VA will give it to you. Like there's so much stuff that the VA gives you that if you go out of the civilian world, you will absolutely break your bank trying to pay for one thing. So if you're able to qualify for the VA, you know, it'll be great. But I think the education just transitioning out of service to know what's out there for us and, and what's able to be provided to us, you know, is a is a really big game changer. Cause I know once I if I got out and knew all the services that I could qualify for, especially knowing that there was a veteran service agency that I could go to that will advocate for me for free, I would have been like, wow, okay, let me try this. You know, let me talk to another veteran to help me get a service connection that took me 10 years because I didn't know what to do. And, you know, I felt abandoned. Like those different, you know, educational piece, I think is very valuable to our military community. I will say, um, since I think I'm the most recent one, like I got out out of this panel, um, I will say I think there's been a lot of improvements in the sense of that I did have a general understanding of what to expect when I was getting out um, and my resources. Also, when I went to community college and I got involved with the veteran space there, um, that's actually how I met Melanie. And she has she's like an encyclopedia of resources so I know I was just very lucky to land on an individual that was like I'm literally going to take your hand and guide you through this like a child she makes me feel like I was definitely taken care of so I guess though I I I guess in the sense of like how to improve um I just would say maybe just individuals who are involved in the veteran space like I, I which I already know because I met so many of these people who work who work within this space. I, I love seeing how eager you guys to learn. I think just encourage those that flame of wanting to know more. The more you know, the more you're knowledgeable, um, the better. Because if you can, it, it's the worst thing that could happen is like you're not updated on the actual resources and you put a veteran towards the direction and they show up and it's not even there anymore. Like that could be very devastating to them. So just to keep eating all this information, staying updated on this information so that when you do come across a veteran that just got out um, and, and maybe you can be that person, maybe you can be their Melanie <laughs> and be like, hey, I know you just got out. Here are all these resources. I hope the I hope the service took care of you in this way, but on the civilian side, I can help you with these things. Um, I guess like just like stay updated. Don't get tired of learning more because I just know the industry is always changing. And it can never be a bad thing to like know what's going on. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that because I, I fully agree. Um, uh, I mentioned I was a researcher before and there's this terminology called the military civilian gap. And because so few of the population of the United States serve um, and there's a smaller percentage of veterans now than there has been in the past, that there's becoming a disconnect between what people know about military service and who they, you know, how many people do you know in the service? So just like was said, be curious, um, bridge that gap, you know, on, try to come to understanding here, like what was said before, listening to people's experiences. That I just, that's the number one, I think. Yes, um, I agree with Mr. Gavin, Mr. Johnny, and Amanda. Um, Reentry is so important in that transition. Military is a, it's a different culture altogether, and uh, being able to reintegrate into society is so important. Um, I um, admire, I love, man, uh, what is it, the Dwyer Project, the Peer to Peer, and I know there's... Um, different clinicians from all over the nations. And the Dwyer Project is so successful. Miss Melanie, I, I give you kudos. I got to give you kudos too. 
you're so instrumental in um in your own position, but it's so important to um re-entry, whether veterans, and I, I have to look from being uh locked up, re-entry back into society. And if you are a clinician and you're on Long Island and your client is a father, Long Island Fatherhood Initiative, we help also with those skills. I have to put a plug in there, but it's very important that we um as men understand our role in the family and that times are changing. We have to be able to uh, change with those times um, and that we have a very important role um, in our families and we are valued. So um, thank you. All right. Thank you to each of the panelists today. We are going to take a break for the next few minutes, but I just want to honor their bravery and their stories and i just think um the unspoken you know stories and perspectives are so so valuable uh and common actually when working with veterans so um more common than than you would think so uh, our attendees and clinicians i hope this was helpful to you and our panelists i'm just humbled and um you know very respectful of what you shared with us today so thank you for that i'll turn it over to melanie and then we're going to take a quick break we, we can take the break now. I just wanted to reiterate the thank you. Um, this panel is like extra scary because a lot of, you know, people are sharing very, very vulnerable things about why they don't self-identify. So thank you guys so much for speaking. Um, and thank you to the audience for being so uh, loving and supportive um, and holding space for this vulnerability. And um, guys, look at, look at all the thanks in the chat. That's all for you. Um, people really appreciate you being vulnerable. All right, so um, I'll see you guys in 10 minutes for our next panel, which is on community building. If you have more questions, um, feel free to throw them in the chat. I am answering them as best as I can. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everybody.